Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tom Banshaw, Vice President for Global Engagement here at Georgetown. And I'm really delighted to welcome you all to our second Global Futures Lecture this afternoon with Dr. Margaret Chan, Director General of the World Health Organization. Our topic is Governance, Global Health's 21st Century Challenge. We're now in the second semester of Global Futures, a university-wide initiative that addresses pressing questions of global scope in their practical and policy, but also in their deeper ethical and value dimensions. Last semester, our topic was global development. Now governance, we will then turn to security in the spring and to the environment next fall. The initiative encompasses high-level talks and dialogues like this one, but also support for research and teaching that connects and builds on our strengths all across the university. The passion and expertise of our faculty and students, our location and convening power here in Washington, D.C., and our Jesuit mission and identity as a university in service to the world. The timing of our topic this semester, governance, is, I think, particularly good. Our first lecture earlier this month featured the new dean of our School of Foreign Service, Dr. Joel Hellman, an expert on issues at the intersection of governance and development. And just this past weekend, as part of the wider context for our gathering this afternoon, more than 100 heads of state met at the United Nations to endorse an ambitious agenda of 17 sustainable development goals. Goal number three, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about today, is of course uh, health-related. Uh, it's a call, an ambitious call for global progress on issues ranging from maternal and child health to combating HIV and non-communicable diseases. And as we know, health also connects to so many of the other goals, ranging from the elimination of poverty to the achievement of gender equality. These global health challenges and all their complexity are issues we grapple with here at Georgetown, across our campus, within the Medical Center, our School of Nursing and Health Studies, our Law Center, other schools and programs. They're issues with a strong justice dimension that involve governance challenges at the local, national, and international levels. They're critical issues that have brought so many of us together this afternoon. It's now my pleasure to introduce our president, Dr. John J. DeJoya, who will introduce Dr. Chan. And he's coming right up now, so I'll keep it brief. <laughs> Just to say that over the past 14 years under President DeJoya's leadership, we've really exemplified the model of an engaged global university in service to the world, a place where we pay attention to our core academic mission, our commitment to excellence in research and teaching, uh, but combine that with the pursuit of the global common good. So please join me in welcoming President Jack DeJoya. Well, thank you very much, Tom. And thank you for your exceptional leadership as our first Vice President for Global Engagement and for pulling together this extraordinary moment that we get to share today. I want to thank you all for being here for this, in this, the second of this semester's Global Futures series. I also wish to recognize and thank John Monahan, uh, the Assistant to the President for Global Health, who will be serving as our conversation moderator a little later in our program, and to all of the students who are part of our undergraduate, graduate, and professional programs in global health. We're grateful to have all of you here with us in Gaston Hall, a place where we have gathered throughout our history for conversations of great consequence and importance to our community and to the larger Washington, D.C. community. This Global Futures Lecture Series helps to deepen that tradition, providing for us the context to welcome distinguished leaders such as Dr. Jim Kim, the President of the World Bank, his colleague, World Bank Chief Economist, Koshik Basu, Raj Shah, former USAID Administrator, who has joined our community as a distinguished fellow in our School of Foreign Service, former Prime Minister Tony Blair, as as Tom just mentioned, the new Dean of our School of Foreign Service, Joel Hellman, and our speaker today, Dr. Margaret Chan, the Director General of the World Health Organization. In just a few weeks, we look forward to welcoming the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Antonio Gutierrez, 
as we continue to engage this semester's theme of global governance. The Global, global Futures Initiative, as Dr. Banshoff described, includes lectures, curriculum development, seminars, and workshops, all to help us imagine and fulfill our roles and responsibilities as a global university. Just last week, the Holy Father, in his address to Congress, spoke of the responsibilities that we have and the significant work that we must do to create a more just and fair world, explaining, quote, how much progress has been made in so many parts of the world, how much has been done in these first years of the third millennium to raise people out of extreme poverty, yet much more still needs to be done, and in times of crisis and economic hardship, a spirit of global solidarity must not be lost. This calling resounds in our efforts through Global Futures to nurture that sense of global solidarity, to pursue deeper understanding and solutions for our common good. This calling rings especially poignantly during this moment in our world defined by great challenge from poverty and violence to threats of climate change and global health. And it is one that our special guest today, Dr. Margaret Chan, seeks to answer in her role as Director General of the World Health Organization. As the international health arm of the United Nations, the WHO is one of our preeminent institutions working to improve health systems around the globe. It works to fight and prevent disease, to promote good health for all, from infants to the elderly, and to lead emergency preparedness, surveillance, and response. Dr. Chan is in her second term as WHO Director General, a post that she was first elected to in 2006. In the years leading up to her election, she served in various leadership roles in the WHO, directing efforts on the human environment and communicable disease, surveillance, and response, and serving as Assistant Director for Communicable Diseases. Before joining the WHO, she served as the Director of Health of Hong Kong for nine years. In that role, she effectively managed responses to both avian, avian influenza and SARS. Throughout her career, she has launched and led initiatives in disease prevention, communicable disease surveillance and response, training for public health professionals, and collaboration from the local to the international levels. She has also championed the important role that women must play in supporting and improving global health. When asked what are some of the simplest ways to see real health gains around the world, she has answered, quote, educating girls and empowering women. Nothing pays a bigger dividend and it keeps paying back from one generation to the next. We're honored to hear from her and to learn from her insights this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Margaret Chan. You are very good, you know I'm short. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, President Jack DeJoya, faculty at the campuses of Georgetown University, students and postgraduate students, ladies and gentlemen, I know I have many old and new friends in this audience. Let me say how happy I am, and it is a great honor to address an event organized by Georgetown University. America's oldest Catholic and Jesuit University. I'm in awe of your history and your achievement. It is really a humbling exercise and afternoon with you to share with some of my thoughts. I look young, but I'm not. <laughs> I spent almost 40 years in public health 
and you know, we have made collectively tremendous progress. But as President De Joya said, we still have a long way to go. So what can young people like you can help us? We need you. You are the future. I'm very well aware of the ethical values that guide the work of this university and its several institutes as well as centers. I'm fully aware of the principles that underpin the global future initiatives, which I just heard so much about. Thank you for taking that leadership on perhaps one of the most timely subjects. Issues of governance, especially in health, will profoundly affect the future of humanity. The Pope's visit to this country has done so much to remind us the human dimensions of climate change, the human dimensions of refugee crisis. He asks all of us to remember the people. Three examples from the previous century offer some perspectives on the complexity of governance challenges facing health in the 21st century. In 1945, Alexander Fleming and two other physicians were awarded the Nobel Prize for, in medicine for their discovery and development of penicillin, the world's first antibiotic. In his acceptance speech, he said, we need to be very careful with penicillin. Yes, it is important. It is a miracle cure. But beware, overuse and underuse would hasten the inevitable development of drug resistance. The era of modern medicine was thus and usher, uh, usher into a prediction that it could almost be stopped abruptly through irresponsible use of fragile medicines. In 1947, a, photo a photograph taken in New York City shows long lines snaking along the city sidewalks and streets as tens of thousands of people patiently waited to be vaccinated against smallpox. The stimulus or the trigger was a single imported case in a business traveler with onward transmission to two other New Yorkers. Millions of city residents were vaccinated within a few weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, those were the days when people had full confidence in science, trusted the advice of health officials, and did as they were told. <laughs> I guess I know what you mean by that laugh. In 1954, the first frozen TV dinners entered the market and very quickly changed the way millions of households spend their evenings. That convenient intervention illustrated the ability of the industry, the industry to capture emerging social needs, social trends, cater to them with innovative products, and reinforce those trends through aggressive marketing. A generation of what we call sedentary, chubby couch potatoes, <laughs> shaped by sinking prices of TV sets, and the appeal of convenience foods was born. The discovery of miracle drugs, public faith in the certainty of science, and the use of new technologies to improve the food supply were all good things that went bad. Fleming's warnings fell on deaf ears. Widespread underuse and overuse of antibiotics sparked the development of microbial resistance to more and more mainstay medicines beginning a trend that would eventually threaten to end modern medicine as we know it. The public lost its faith in science. People no longer lined up obediently to follow public health advice. Vaccine refusals, also seen in this country, show how health decisions can be influenced by the most popular website, the most articulate blocker, or the politician with the loudest voice and the most press. Advances in food technology make the food supply more secure, and they also change its nature. The industrialization of food production paved the way for a corporate approach 
to food supply. That concentrated almost exclusively on increasing the quantities and reducing the cost of food. That's good. That's why we get bigger and bigger portion size, right? And cheaper and cheaper price. The primary purpose of the food system, and that is to sustain human life in good health, got lost along the way. As the previous century drew to a close, obesity began to reach epidemic proportions, first in adults in wealthy countries, then in their children, and then nearly everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, despite these ominous trends, the 21st century began very well for public health. The Millennium Declaration and its eight goals, including three directly related to health, provide an outstanding example of how an instrument for global governance aimed at reducing human misery can do enormous, enormous good. 15 years ago, human misery was thought to have a discrete set of principal causes like poverty, hunger, poor waters and sanitation, several infectious diseases, and lack of essential care during childhood, pregnancy, and childbirth. The result of that focus and all the energy, resources, and innovation it unleashed exceeded the wildest dreams of many. And I have to say, U.S., as a country, make major contribution to that. It demonstrated the power of international solidarity and brought out the best in human nature. Maternal and child mortality fell at the fastest rate in history, with some of the sharpest drops recorded in sub-Saharan Africa. Every day, 17,000 fewer children die than in 1990. AIDS reached a tipping point when the number of people newly receiving antiretroviral therapy surpassed the number of new infections. Since the start of this century, an estimated 37 million lives were saved by effective diagnosis and treatment of tuberculosis. Over the same period, deaths from malaria declined by 60%. An estimated 6.2 million lives, mainly in young African children, were saved. Drug donations by the pharmaceutical industry allowed WHO to reach more than 800 million people every year with preventive therapy for leprosy, sleeping sickness, river blindness, and other neglected tropical diseases. These are ancient diseases debilitating diseases that anchor more than one billion people in poverty, especially women and children. By reaching so many millions, we are paving the way for a mass exodus from poverty. Last week, in New York, the United Nations General Assembly finalized a new agenda for sustainable development. The agenda show how dramatically the world has changed in just the past 15 years. The number of development goals has grown from 8 to 17, and while the number of targets shot up from 21 to 169, I wonder how many people can remember them. The factors that now govern the well-being of human condition and the planet that sustains it are no longer so discreet. The new agenda will try to shape a very complex and a very different world. This is a world that is seeing not the best in human nature, but the worst. International terrorism, senseless mass shooting, bombings in markets and places of worship, ancient and priceless archaeological sites reduced to rubble, and the seemingly endless armed conflicts that have contributed to the worst refugee crisis since the end of the Second World War. Ladies and gentlemen, since the start of this century, newer threats to health 
have gained prominence. Like the other problems I have just mentioned that cloud humanity's prospects for a sustainable future, these newer threats to health are much bigger and more complex than the problems that dominated the health agenda 15 years ago. All around the world, health is being shaped by the same powerful forces like population aging, rapid urbanization, and the globalized marketing of unhealthy products. Under the pressure of these forces, chronic non-communicable diseases have overtaken infectious diseases as the world's biggest killers. This shift in the disease burden has profound implications. It, ch it challenges the very way social economic progress is defined. Beginning in the 19th century, improvements in hygiene and living conditions were followed by vast improvements in health status and life expectancy. These environmental improvements aided the control of infectious diseases, totally vanquishing many major killers from modern societies. Today, the tables are turned. Instead of diseases vanishing as living conditions improve, social economic progress is actually creating the conditions that favor the rise of non-communicable diseases. Economic growth, modernization, and urbanization have opened wide the entry point for the spread of unhealthy lifestyles. How many of you walk to school? Oh, that's pretty good. I'm impressed. And how many of you drive? I don't believe so few hands. <laughs> I mean, this is modern society. These are the challenges we have to tackle. So friends, colleagues, the world is indeed ill-prepared to cope with these new threats. Very few health systems were built to manage chronic, if not lifelong, diseases. Even fewer doctors were trained to prevent them, and even fewer governments can afford to treat them. In some countries, the cost of treating diabetes alone absorb about 25 to 50 percent of the entire health budget. Every new cancer medicine approved in 2014 by the US FDA costs more than $120,000 per person per year. Just think about the serials. Some of these drugs extend life for only a few months. The climate also is changing. WHO recent estimate that air pollution alone kills around 7 million people each year. And this has finally given health a place in debates about the consequences of climate change. Worldwide, this past July was the hottest since at least 1880 when re records began. This year's thousands of deaths associated with the heat waves in India and Pakistan provide further headline evidence of the health effects of extreme weather events. Another challenge, antimicrobial resistance, is now regarded as a major health and medical crisis. Highly resistant superbugs haunt every emergency rooms and intensive care unit around the world. Gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is now resistant to multiple classes of drugs. An epidemic of drug-resistant typhoid fever is rolling across parts of Asia and Africa. Even with the best of care, only around half of all the cases of multidrug-resistant tuberculosis can be cured. The blockbuster drugs for the pharmaceutical industry are those that manage chronic conditions, not brief episodes of infection. With very few new antibiotics or antimicrobials in the pipeline, the world is heading towards a post-antibiotic era when common infections will once again kill. Some sophisticated interventions, like joint replacements, organ transplants, cancer chemotherapy, and care of preterm babies would become far more difficult or even too dangerous to undertake. 
These newer threats to health do not neatly fit the biomedical model that has historically guided public health responses. Their root causes lie outside the traditional domain of public health. Preventive efforts that aim to address these root causes often face fierce competition and opposition from powerful economic operators like the tobacco, alcohol, food and beverage industries and their equally powerful lobbies. Economic power readily translates into political power. World Bank data, which was um, you know, 2011 data, show that more than 60% of the world's 175 largest economic entities were companies, not countries. Data also show that this concentration of power is rapidly growing. Long experience tells us that ministers of health look at the medical evidence. They look at the science. But ministers of trade and finance often listen to other voices. No one working in public health should underestimate the challenges that lie ahead. The health sector acting alone cannot protect children from the marketing of unhealthy foods and beverages, persuade countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, or get industrialized food producers to reduce their massive use of antibiotics. Ladies and gentlemen, the newer threats to health also lie beyond the traditional domain of sovereign nations, accustomed to governing what happens in their territories. In a world of radically interdependence, all of these threats are transboundary. The globalized marketing of unhealthy products respects no borders. By definition, a changing climate affects the entire planet. As sharply illustrated by malaria, tuberculosis, and bacteria carrying the NDM1 enzyme, drug resistance pathogens travel very well internationally. They don't need visas. Some multinational corporations can be an other transboundary threat. Countries wishing to protect their citizens through larger pictorial warnings on tobacco packages or by introducing plain packaging are being intimidated. Intimidated by the reality of lengthy and costly litigation initiated by the tobacco industry. Mechanisms for settling investor state disputes are being used to sue governments for tobacco legislation that hurts industry profits. Today, ladies and gentlemen, for your information, Australia has spent nearly $50.50 million defending its right to introduce plain packaging. I hope scholars and students at Georgetown will watch all this very closely. What is at stake here is nothing less than the sovereign right of a nation to enact legislation that protects its citizens from harm. In this regard, David Cho warmly welcomes the Lancet Georgetown Commission on Global Health and Law. We face other challenges. The poverty map, the poverty map has changed. Today, 70% of the world's poor live in middle-income countries. This is a game-changing statistic. Growth in, growth in GDP has long been the yardstick for measuring national progress. If the economy is doing well, where is the incentive to invest in equitable health care? The world does not need any more rich countries full of poor people. Our world is profoundly interconnected, and this too has consequences. The refugee crisis in Europe shattered the notion that wars in faraway lands will stay remote. The Ebola outbreak shattered the notion 
that a disease of poor African nations will have no consequences elsewhere. You saw it in USA here. It happened also in Spain and in other Western countries. So ladies and gentlemen, in Guinea, where the Ebola outbreak began in late 2013, the virus circulated undetected off every radar screen for at least three months. In Liberia and Sierra Leone, the virus also circulated undetected for several weeks. In all three countries, the health system was broken, following years of civil war and unrest. This means these countries actually, as we are speaking, they have no isolation wards in their hospitals, no culture of preventing disease transmission in healthcare settings, many hospitals with no electricity or running water, a severe shortage of doctors and nurses, and a deeply mistrustful population that prefer care from traditional healers rather than doctors and nurses in hospitals. WHO and the international community were too slow to recognize the explosive potential of the outbreak. The world as a whole lacked adequate response capacity. The virus ran way ahead of control efforts for many months. Though Ebola had been known for four decades, clinicians, doctors, they were empty-handed because there's no vaccines and no treatment to reduce the horrific loss of life. With the agreement of the WHO member states, I am putting in place a number of reform designed to increase surge capacity, to better response to future outbreaks and health emergencies, speed up the deployment, recruitment and deployment of staff and supplies, and secure the funds to do so. The Ebola outbreak is not yet over, but we are very close. We are in a phase where we can track each and every chain of transmission and break them. To get to that phase, the Big Show deployed more than 1,000 staff to 68 field sites in the three countries, 10, size, 10 times our normal capacity. The world, thank goodness, is on the verge of having a safe and effective Ebola vaccine. The ongoing WHO clinical trial in Guinea was recently extended to Sierra Leone at the request of the government. Being able to vaccinate close contacts of confirmed cases give us another ring of protection. WHO, working with partners and in the industry, has pre-qualified four rapid point-of-care diagnostic tests. These tests are important, especially when health systems begin to recover. Being able to rapidly screen new emissions and test whether they are infected with Ebola virus, especially in high-risk settings like the maternity and the surgical wards, build confidence and trust in the health system for patients and for the staff alike. As a contribution to preparedness, we are developing a blueprint, a blueprint for generic clinical trial protocols and arrangements for fast-track regulatory approval to expedite the development of new medical products during the next emergency. This was not done in the past. All these preparedness has to be done in advance of a crisis. This is a big lesson for all of us. During a crisis, you have confusion. Systems don't work. You know, coordination is difficult. Trust is not there. So the lesson we learned is advanced preparation, we call it preparedness, to respond, working with partners, working with governments, bringing together you know, the surge capacity that the world could bring to bear on the next threat is extremely important. Ladies and gentlemen, I have one final question. Do you think the international community can compensate for the absence of strong health systems with surveillance and laboratory capacity in any given country? 
Can an international agency like the Big Cho do this? Not entirely. Managing the global regime for coordinating the international spread of disease is a central and historical responsibility of the Big Cho. But no regime of global governance can manage the invisible. You cannot manage what you cannot measure, and you cannot manage what you cannot see. This opinion is shared by other friends and colleagues in global health. In the most dramatic and tragic way possible, the Ebola outbreak focused international attention on the need for building strong, functional, resilient health systems, especially in fragile states. In fact, some analysts argue that universal health coverage is the best defense against the infectious disease threat nationally and internationally. Having good data on normal disease patterns is important, especially at the community level. That helps you to distinguish and recognize an unusual disease event like Ebola. The attention that the world has given to the importance of health systems is a most welcome focus. And that message was very strong last week, not last week, two days ago in New York, as heads of governments and heads of states endorse the sustainable development goals for the next 15 years. The global health initiatives, like Global Fund and Gavi, that brought such spectacular results, did so largely in the last 15 years by delivering commodities, bed nets, vaccines, and cocktails of medicine. Confronted with weak health systems, these global health initiatives often build their own parallel systems for procurement, for delivery, as well as financial management and reporting. This is not needed. This caused duplication, fragmentation, and we don't have enough resources to continue in that manner. Fortunately, as I said, the debate and the discussion last week in New York, many development partners now recognize that virtually all health goals under goal number three, Tom, uh, you know, need a strong uh, functioning health system. And not just the health goal alone. Health is related to nutrition. Health is linked to environment. Health is also linked to waters and sanitation. So, you know, we need to think of a comprehensive, integrated approach to address the complex, multiple challenges the world is giving us. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is dangerously ill-prepared. Ill-prepared to cope with a severe new disease. But we have not seen the worst case scenario yet. The worst case scenario would be a disease spread by the airborne route by a very contagious and severe pathogen. And it is difficult to recognize the signs of illness during the incubation period. We have not seen that yet. Thank goodness. And we don't want to see it. But it is in our collective interest that we get the world better prepared, learn all the lessons from Ebola, so that the people of this world can be better protected. As the Pope says, remember the people. This is what we are here for. Thank you. Dr. Chan, when we uh, invited you to come, I said, uh, you know, don't pull any punches and, don't, don't, and don't, don't, don't keep the agenda small because you've uh, you laid out a tremendous agenda for us there. But let me, uh, let me ask one question and then we'll invite um, questions from the, uh, the audience. Um, you spoke at the end, well, maybe we should start at the end, of the challenge the world faces in terms of global health security to be prepared. 
we had an example in Ebola, and you said the WHO moved too slowly. So what, when you look back with the, with the 2020 hindsight, what would, what would you, what would the WHO have done differently? But more importantly, to build that system that we talked about, that international system that you laid out that would be resilient and strong, what do we need to do in terms of governance? Because the governance system we have today does not seem to work to meet the kind of challenges we're facing. Yes, you raised two questions. The first one is, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, what would WHO do differently? WHO as an organization, for the past 70 years, we've been managing small, medium-sized outbreaks comfortably. Maybe too comfortable. We did not invest in our capacity, in our preparedness for huge outbreak, especially huge outbreak in fragile states. Because in, in many of these countries, when their health system collapsed, literally the international community, and including WHO, we act as the last sort of, you know, the, the last provider. You know? So this is the challenge. We did not anticipate that. So going forward, we need to change in WHO. Now, you talk about global governance doesn't work. Well, the International Health Regulation is a legal treaty signed by 194 states. But, you know, if I tell you, only 64 countries honor their commitment to have the capacity for surveillance supported by laboratory to detect early trouble and provide timely reporting. So what does that mean? That means political commitment is good, but political commitment does not translate into action. And keeping your promises is no good. And we are you know, facing this big challenge in global health governance. Everybody also talk about sovereign state, the power of the country. The tension between sovereign state and being a good global citizen as part of the global solidarity mm -hmm. is also a tension we need to address. So the World Health Organization is, um, well, I... Um, Mandated by the member states, I put together a group of um, countries to come together and look at the international health regulation and see what are the changes that need to be put in place. Incentives for countries to report early, support for countries to build capacity, especially countries who do not have the means to do so yet, and also um, disincentive for governments who overreact and punish governments that are transparent. In uh, 2009-2010, Mexico reported the H1N1 pandemic very timely and promptly. Immediately, Mexico was punished by trade ban and travel ban. So if you punish governments who are transparent like this, why should they be transparent? So we need to look at the duty, responsibility of, uh, you know, uh, the state, uh, of, you know, fellow states and civil society, industry, uh, also international organization. And let's not forget very important universities like George Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Well, let, speaking of, I was going to invite some, if, if uh, any students would like to come up, we've got a microphone in the uh, middle aisle here if anybody wants to ask questions. Um, if you come up and identify yourself uh, and what school you're in, we'll, we'll take a few questions. And so sure. appreciate this, Dr. Chan. Please. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Chan, for being at Georgetown and for being a leader in global health. My name is Spencer Crawford. I'm a senior in the School of Foreign Service. I'm studying religion and global health. I'm also uh, a research assistant at the World Face Development Dialogue here at the Berkeley Center at Georgetown. And I'm a member of Partners in Health Engage. Um, my question actually relates to what you just said about the duties of the state, um, particularly the United States. And uh, it's no secret that the United States has been a huge contributor to um, the fight against HIV AIDS. Um, but recently, uh, particularly under the arm of PEPFAR, but uh, last year was the first year that PEPFAR actually saw a decline or a decrease in the number of patients um, put on antiretroviral therapy. And I was wondering, I had two questions. One, should Congress restore levels of funding for PEPFAR 
um, to levels that it was in in 2011, so an increase of $300 million. And two, what should 2016 presidential um, candidate hopefuls, uh, what, what, what efforts or what commitments should they make to make um, global health and right to, uh, yeah, to, to make the right to health, make there be a right to health? Thank you for those two important questions. They are dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but I will venture an answer. <laughs> I've been in um, WHO, working in WHO from, uh, since 2003, so more than 10 years, 12 years. And I have to say, US government is still the biggest contributor to the United Nations systems and also through bilateral or global health initiative like Gavi, Global Fund, and PEPFAR support many countries of the world. And the statistics I uh, quoted during the, uh, my speech on the improvement of maternal, newborn, and child health, malaria, HIV, TB, to a large extent, is a contribution of the US government. Now, having said that, yes, of course, everybody wants more money. <laughs> but where to cut? Do you like the government to increase your tax? So there is no free lunch. Let's be frank. You know, how do we make use of existing resources to get the maximum benefit? And this is the conversation in New York uh, last few days. Mm -hmm. Instead of having vertical uh, disease-specific program, perhaps this time we should consolidate, integrate, and get the synergy. Let me give you an example. Why do you need two procurement systems for uh, HIV medicines and also for malaria com commodities. You, all you need is one good logistic system, the end-to-end -end system to serve all the diseases. Now, of course, I, I, I hope that you know, Congress can give more money, but uh, as I said, money is tight everywhere. 2016 presidential hopeful. <laughs> Let me do some calculation first. Take office in 2017, right? The new president. Mm -hmm. That's okay. You know, I, I, I think, you know, you will... The Americans are smart people. They know what to choose, who to choose. And your vote has the most powerful influence on the uh, potential candidate to do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was very political and being... I know, it's, it's impressive. <laughs> Trying to na navigate uh, in a very narrow space. That was, I was very impressive. I was wondering where you were going with that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I wish you the best of luck. Uh, what you're doing is so important. When the, uh, well, invite the next person up here, please. And again, please identify yourself. It's hard to see here, but please. I'll see if I can talk into this correctly. Um, I'm Alex Rowling. I am a Global Futures Fellow, and I'm getting a master's degree in conflict resolution. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so earlier you discussed the, the issues involved with reporting um, from uh, especially developing countries um, whose health systems are not as intact. Um, with the rise in the availability and access to social media platforms and the internet in general, there is the possibility for, for civilians, for just the average citizen to report um, as well. What do you see as the future of that as it relates to the WHO and other global governance organizations? And where would the line potentially be drawn um, when you start to get into the issues you discussed of, of over-reporting and being inundated with too much information, so where do you draw the line between individual reporting and leaving it up to the experts? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, congratulations for engaging in a very difficult subject called conflict resolution. <laughs> and we hope to learn from you. Um, on that, you know, we, we learned that um, dialogue, engagement, and sometimes quiet diplomacy is important to get some um, inroads to solve uh, you know, some of the mega challenges we are dealing with. You mentioned about the role of um, you know, social media. I think we are at the best of time in terms of the ICT platform to you know, uh, promote transparency and accountability. 
And we believe in that, in the Big Cho, and that is part of my uh, reform agenda, to hold everybody to account. But, you know, in, in a relationship, when you have involved partners, so mutual accountability is the way to go. Because, you know, far too often I hear comments from civil society organizations, patients group, they say that, you know, our leaders promise a lot, but they don't deliver. And how can you earn the trust of the community if you keep over-promising and underperforming? So I think the role of citizen governance is going to grow. And as you well know, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, was open up for a global conversation. That was a very brave decision of the UN Secretary General. Uh, the MDGs was uh, uh, designed in a room without windows. For those of you who don't know it, it was just done within days uh, by a, a group of very talented people. So the criticism at that time was it was not inclusive, and then people don't embrace it until five years later. So we lost five years in terms of delivering on the outcome of MDGs. So this time around, Mr. Secretary General, in consultation with countries, opened up the conversation. And of course, uh, to make the long story short, when you open up for conversation, you have many demands and many asks. So that's why we move from eight goals to 17 goals. 21 targets to 169 targets. But the good thing about the uh, sustainable development goal, John, is that it is universal. It applies to every country, be it high income, middle income, or low income countries. You are answerable to your people to deliver on your promises and to make sure that the growth, the, uh, the economic growth, the social you know, uh, growth, uh, social uh, economic and environmental pillars get the right balance. And we need all those to make people happy, healthy, and for me in health, it's not just the absence of disease. We need health, happiness, and well-being. So, thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's see. We got. Can you see them? I, I can't either. No. Okay. One of the reasons we're looking out like this is that it, we're, the lights are just so that we can't. But please go ahead and come to the light. Sorry, you can't see me. My name is Nigel. <laughs> but we can I'm, hear you. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah we can hear you, Nigel. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a first year medical student and I'm also an international student from Zimbabwe. Uh, this is it's kind of a question, but it's a little bit ambitious. So I know one of the biggest problems with the UN slash the WHO is the money. Uh, the money. You guys depend on funds that come from donor countries and sometimes people pledge and they don't give you the money. So have you ever considered possibly investing some of the money that you get and then starting something that's more of an income generating body because uh, I know people are very willing to give money but at some point in time, uh, people get tired of giving money. So if you have your own thing that generates money, you can do the things that you want to do and not have to ask for money as often. You are very entrepreneurial. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is a, a good spirit, and uh, in fact, uh, at least in, in Dabik Cho, I cannot speak for other agencies. We are beginning to look at some of the services we are providing to people, whether at least we, we make it a cost recovery, full cost recovery, instead of you know, subsidizing the service. So uh, countries and the industry are prepared to look at those models. It's very small, of course, you know, but it is important to start. Uh, you're right. Sustainability of organization is important, but we also need to be responsible for the way, on the way how we manage resources that are provided to us by the countries and also by the contributors to the Big Joe. Uh, we have about a $4 billion budget for two years, and there is no lack of money. That's the good thing. But what is interesting for me is the mismatch of uh, 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 the resources. You know, in some areas which are the uh, favorite uh, yes. of uh, donor the countries, exactly. and then you get uh, um, plenty of resources. 
But in important areas, for example, health system. Uh, another important example is non-communicable diseases. I don't have the funding. We need to do the work. So this mismatch is something I'm working with uh, the countries in WHO to address through something we call it financing dialogue. And actually, the purpose of my visit to U.S. is having a financing dialogue discussion with the U.S. government. And we had a whole day meeting yesterday to align our strategic mutual uh, priorities. You can't expect people to give you money if that's not their priority. I mean, this is the reality. And of course, you know, the, the word mutual is important. And, you know, it is good for both sides. Thank you. That's an excellent point. Let's see. I'm getting a sign here that this will be our final question, so I'm sorry to folks in the rest of the line here, but, but uh, please go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Yvonne. I'm a student from BB program. And so my question is, uh, will it be helpful for um, entities like Taiwan to join WHO hmm. to improve global solidarity while the world community deals with uh, global health challenges? And um, should political issues be an obstacle to improve global solidarity? Thank you. You asked one of the most difficult questions <laughs> for the <WHO>. show. <laughs> OK, uh, let me tell you exactly what's happening in WHO. Uh, the Uh The member states of uh, the organization has passed a resolution to recognize the one China policy. So as the director general of the World Health Organization, I have to uh, honor that uh, resolution uh, required of me. But since I took office, I took office in the early 2007, I was in dialogue, in discussion uh, with the uh, Chinese government. And exactly, I was saying, you know, there got to be a way uh, to, to include Taiwan's participation uh, in the World Health Assembly. And with the support of the Chinese government, they were actually very receptive and open-minded. Uh, I, on an annual basis now, in discussion with Beijing, invite Taiwan to attend the World Health Assembly. But, you know, we need to distinguish uh, two parts. The technical part, you know, we engage with Taiwan, but the policy and the political, the one country, uh, one China policy, which is also something I need to honor. So we need to separate the political and the technical uh, uh, dimensions. But so far, we are pretty good, doing pretty good. Well, let me thank you. And I, I think if I could ask everyone to give Dr. Chan a Thank you so much. Your, your remarks certainly illustrated the critical nature of governance and global health. So thank you. Thank you, thank everyone. You.